Representing lights in a physically based 3D renderer should ideally be consistent with real light sources. The sun should be tremendously brighter than a light bulb, and a close light bulb should be tremendously brighter than a distant star. In software, we can really choose any arbitrary way to represent this relationship, but choosing real-world lighting units can make things easier. As for which lighting units to choose, there are two primary routes we can take, radiometric units or photometric units. Radiometric units represent actual optical radiation measurements that include not only visible light, but other wavelength ranges such as ultraviolet and infrared. Photometric units are simply radiometric units scaled by the sensitivity of the human eye for particular wavelengths. Here are the most relevant radiometric units with their analogous photometric units. Radiant and luminous flux represent power, with the watt and lumen being the unit for both respectively. Radiant and luminous intensity represent power per unit solid angle, with luminous intensity using the candela as its standard unit. Two light sources with the same lumens can have vastly different luminous intensities at different angles. For example, a laser produces very bright light in a single direction, where a light bulb with the same lumen output will distribute light over many more directions. Irradiance and illuminance represent power per unit area, with illuminance using lux as its unit. Illuminance represents the lumens incident on a surface. Lastly, radiance and luminance represent power per unit solid angle per unit area, with luminance using the nit as its unit. Luminance, for instance, represents how much luminous power is detected when looking at a surface from a particular viewing angle and corresponds to perceived brightness. This scaling factor between radiometric and photometric units is represented by the CIE photometric curve. You can see that the human eye is most sensitive to light with a 555 nanometer wavelength, which appears green to us. This means that the luminous efficacy at this wavelength is 100%, with longer and shorter wavelengths dropping in efficacy along a bell shape. If we wanted to accurately use radiometric quantities in our non-spectral renderer, we would have to provide the efficacy value of the light source to be able to represent its appearance. It isn't convenient, however, to always provide both intensity and efficacy for each light. For instance, two lights can produce the same amount of lumens with different combinations of wattage and efficacy. From a graphics perspective, since we're primarily worried about appearance, it's more convenient to only worry about perceptual units like the lumen instead of wattage and efficacy. This is why I decided to go with photometric units, but before we can actually use them, we have to think of how to set up our virtual camera to interpret them. The problem is that the range of luminous values in real life is much larger than what a camera can actually represent. This means that we have to normalize the total range of measured luminance to the camera's range through a process called exposing. We first find what's called the exposure value, which is based on three variables, the camera's aperture size, shutter speed, and ISO. Aperture is the size of the opening allowing light to the sensor, and is represented in f-stops. It changes not only how much light reaches the sensor, but also depth of field. In that regard, a larger aperture corresponds to a more out-of-focus image in areas farther from the focal point. Next, shutter speed also dictates how much light reaches the camera sensor by exposing it for longer or shorter amounts of time. This affects motion blur, which is when a moving object appears streaked or blurred across an image due to different points on the sensor capturing the object at different times. Lastly, ISO values represent how sensitive a camera sensor is to light. Doubling the ISO will double the brightness of a photo, with the side effect being that higher ISO usually corresponds to a more grainy image. 1EV is typically defined for an ISO of 100, and combinations of aperture size and shutter speed can produce the same EV, with trade-offs between motion blur and depth of field. For instance, with an ISO of 100, a 1 500th second shutter speed with an f over 1.4 aperture represents 10 EV. A 1 4th second shutter speed and an f over 16 aperture also represents 10 EV, but has a less dramatic depth of field and higher motion blur compared to the prior configuration. If you use the same parameters with an ISO of 200 instead, everything would shift up 1 EV. For an ISO of 400, you would shift up 2 EV, and so on. Once we decide on an EV, we need to derive the photometric exposure from it, which actually represents the luminance that reaches the camera in lux seconds. Photometric exposure H is defined as such. 
where T is shutter speed, N is aperture, L is incoming luminance, and Q is based on the transmittance and vignetting factor of the lens. A value of 0.65 is typically used for Q. There are a few different ways to relate photometric exposure to sensitivity, but we'll use saturation-based sensitivity, defined as the maximum exposure possible that does not lead to clipped or bloomed camera output. SBS is the fine as such, where S's are ISO and 78 is a factor chosen so that the exposure settings for a standard light meter represents an 18% reflective surface, or middle gray, with a 12.7% saturation. This is derived from dividing 18 by the square root of 2, giving the image a half stop of headroom to deal with specular reflections, which could be much brighter than a perfectly white surface. Taking our original definition of H, we can solve for L to find the maximum luminance which would saturate our camera sensor. And assuming we're using an ISO of 100, we can rewrite n squared over t as 2 raised to our EV, since EV is defined as log base 2 of n squared over t. Additionally, we can replace s and q, since we already know their values. So overall, the maximum luminance for saturating the sensor can be defined as 1.2 times 2 raised to our EV for an ISO of 100. Now, let's actually get outside and find some real-world illuminance values to compare against. It's currently April in the southern United States where I live, and I came to this open meadow on a partially cloudy day. I also brought a cheap lux meter to get some readings on the maximum recorded illuminance on the ground. It's difficult to see on camera, but I was getting a max lux of about 75 kilolux, or 75,000 lux, which is reasonable for a day like today. Let's go back home and see how we can put all this together in our shader. The two most important functions for us are compute EV100 and convert EV100 to exposure. The math here is equivalent to what we talked about earlier, but reduced for efficiency, as found in Frostbite's paper on moving their engine to being physically based. Further down, I set my camera settings to have an aperture of f over 16, shutter speed of 1 60th of a second, and an ISO of 100 to obtain a 14 EV, which is typical for a partially cloudy day. It's important to mention that because I haven't implemented depth of field or motion blur, the combination of shutter speed and aperture settings are arbitrary in my case, as long as they generate the same EV. Continuing, I set the illuminance coming from the sun and sky to 75,000 lux, which is what we got outside with our lux meter. We apply this to our direct and ambient lighting. I'm also applying an up factor to my ambient lighting to make it look a bit less flat considering I haven't implemented any global illumination or ambient occlusion. This slightly scales down the ambient light brightness of surfaces not facing up. Afterwards, I apply shadows from direct lighting before dividing by our exposure. Remember, this value describes the maximum luminance possible in our scene, so this division maps our scene luminance to our camera's displayable range. And finally, I apply ACES filmic tone mapping before outputting the color. Let's first take a look at this 3D drone scan of a grass field. With 14 EV, the field looks pretty reasonable for the lighting conditions, but we can take it a step further. On my phone, I can see the exposure parameters it used when taking this picture of the meadow that day that I recorded illuminance. There's an ISO of 80, aperture of f over 1.78, and a shutter speed of 1 8929ths of a second. I'll plug these values into my shader, except I'll scale the time that the shutter is open by 80% of its current value, since I want to keep my ISO at 100, not 80. The EV produced, however, is the same. Comparing my render to the picture I took, you can see that besides some differences in the color of the grass and possibly different tone mapping curves, the lighting looks pretty consistent. Now, let's look at the Sponza asset with the same settings. It's pretty dark, which makes sense considering much of our scene is in shadow, and the gray bricks do absorb a good bit of light. The problem is that there's just less total luminance on our scene for the camera to pick up with our current EV settings. So just like a real camera, we can increase our exposure by dropping our EV to something like 12 by setting shutter speed to 1 60th of a second and aperture to f over 8. Now the scene looks properly exposed. Many cameras have the ability to perform auto exposure specifically for this purpose. It's much more convenient to not have to dial in EV settings whenever you move between areas of different lighting conditions.
For now though, I'll leave auto exposure along with depth of field and motion blur as some possible next steps in this project. I'll add links to the research and assets I used throughout the video in the description, but otherwise, thanks for watching and I hope you learned something.